Welcome to Sports Talk with Kifuen. I'm your host, Kifuen Jabulo Ramasang, and this is the interview edition of Sports Talk with Kifuen. Right? Um, right now, we have one of the most talented batsmen in the world. Even Brian Lara, after seeing this man bat in Abu Dhabi, was like, I have got to meet that guy. <laughs> and yeah, hopefully he'll get to play for the pro tiers very soon. Um, welcome to the show, Tori. How's it, Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. Hi, <laughs> right, bye. I'm good. I'm always good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, let's first start off with um, how did you start um, playing cricket? Uh, what got you into the sport? Uh, obviously, it's like most guys started in primary school. Um, I played most of the sports um, and then once I um, <clears throat> got into high school, obviously you have to start making decisions because not a lot of time. So you've got to pick your, your favorite ones. So I went with cricket. Um, but yeah, I've been playing since I was uh, young. Um, obviously, like I said, when you're younger, you play all the sports, soccer, tennis, whatever. And then um, there was a bit of time where I didn't think I was going to play cricket because it was taking a lot of time in the afternoons when you're young. Mm. But <laughs> I decided to stick with it still. <laughs> I can understand. We used to play, uh, I also used to play a bit. Uh, used to play T20s and they take so much time. Oh. Yeah, when you're young, all your friends are like going to each other's houses, having sleepovers or whatever. And then you're like, ah, sorry guys, I've got a cricket game. So, yeah, but anyway, it was it wasn't worth it, that, I guess. It wasn't that fun, but the sacrifice right now most likely must be worth it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, uh, how did your coach Clint Flynn, the late Clint Flynn, influence you uh, when he was coaching you in primary? Uh, yeah, obviously, I made mention to him once in a, mm. a pre a after match, whatever interview thing. Yeah, um, it was just a he was a great, a great guy, a great person, a good father as well. And I think, yeah, most importantly, besides being a, a nice or good cricket coach, he was um, one of those coaches that always tried to. You know, make make it fun, make it exciting, make sure guys were still enjoying and loving the game as well as being competitive. Um, he hated losing. Um, I mean, he used to coach uh, soccer as well, and he hated losing. So he kind of, from a younger age, and I'm sure he got in, uh, made an impact on a lot of young guys' lives. Mm -hmm. Got that feeling of you know being competitive, doing everything you can to to win with obviously within the laws of the game, and then um, yeah, and, and just being a, a very fair person. And like I said. Um, he always tried his best to get to know guys and, and make guys um, feel comfortable and made everyone feel important in a team. So I thought he was a, a great person besides for being a, a really good coach, especially with the younger guys. Hmm. So how uh, do you get to go to King Edwards? How does that happen? Because, hey, <laughs> it's not cheap. And it's one of those elite schools where uh, King Edwards has produced a lot of pro tiers. So how did you go to King Edwards? Um, we, I don't know if they still have it now or what, it, or what it's called, but it used to be called far north, like provincials and stuff mm. uh, in primary school. So I used to make, obviously guys make that under 13 provincial week, far north, and then you play Kauteng and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and then luckily I was approached um, to get a bursary at CARES. I think it was CARES and Stidians and a few guys. My One of my good friends also, uh, Bongi Squasher, he... Um, he also got a lot of offers and I think that just kind of happened when you played provincials you were lucky enough to get offers and you just went with whatever school you thought was best fit for you um, I know all the other a lot of the other schools were private schools but you had to go on those tours and stuff like that and I just felt like it was a school that when I went for the tours went to the hostels and stuff like that I don't know there was something that just clicked I think Keaton um, Jennings took me on my tour um, he was head he was head boy at the time Mm. And David Mukhtane as well. And they took, there was a bunch of us. And yeah, just the stuff they said kind of inspired me. I remember he said something along the lines of like, the school is what you put in is what you'll get out. And, it, and it's obviously success-wise and failure-wise. So I just thought it was a good fit. Um, and like I said, I guess I was very lucky because I don't think my mom would have been able to afford it off the bat. So the bursary obviously helped a lot. Mm. So how... how so okay you get to care so how's the experience there and uh the brotherhood how how how, do, how does it feel and how does the transition most likely you went to like an 
uh, like a mixed school with the with boys and girls. Now, what is the transition moving to an old boys school like kids? Uh, yeah, for me, it, it was a, a big uh, transition. Obviously, I stayed at home. I went to a co-ed school. Um, so I was obviously naughty at primary school. I had, I used to have, um, I've always had messy hair, but I used to have cornrows. So when, obviously, once I got into kids, I had to cut it all off. Um, so it was, it was that, how could I say, learning, especially to, at first, you just need to fit in. Um, mm. Everyone, like, you know, like I said, it's like military, not military, but... <laughs> like strict, strict rules, everyone needs to look the same or whatever, and then coming to terms with that, but still managing to hold on to your own identity within those parameters. Um, and that's probably why I had a bit of a challenge authority kind of um, personality. But mm. like you said, the experience within the brotherhood was special. I mean, I was lucky enough, I played rugby as well. So if you play rugby, you get to go onto the field with war cries and that kind of stuff. So you really feel a part of the school um, you know, you see the guys once you're in grade eight, you see the guys with the different colored blazers, and obviously, then you have your dreams and mm. things of you want to do, like, oh, I want my name on the board, or I want to have that blazer and stuff like that. So, I think also at Cares, I was lucky. You are kind of lucky that there are a lot of role models, teachers that are either past sportsmen or whatever, and then obviously, prefects that are either playing SA schools, rugby, cricket. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of guys that you can look up to. Um, and then obviously I was lucky enough to also be a hostel boy. So staying at the school was awesome. I made friends that I'm still friends with um, now. Um, and you, yeah, you just have different kind of experience to day boys. And you, yeah, like I said, you're part of the school. You've got to do punishment, all those kind of things. But it's fun when you look back at it, you, you wouldn't change any of it. So, yeah, uh, and it was um, all this, uh, so, you having um, you have the privilege of having other people that let's say a bit further down the line um, in terms of playing like for SA schools whereas a lot of people uh, let's say a lot of people in other schools let's say if you didn't go to like one of those uh, cares or whatever you wouldn't usually have that um, what's this uh, advantage of seeing someone that's achieved that obviously in the school yeah. that i went to only one person ever played sa schools okay yeah. when i was there so only one person yeah. but how 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 did that mold you or how did those people influence or you especially was there anyone um, that was really close to you uh in grade eight you at also you had to have a like you were he's i didn't really know what you call it they didn't have a specific name for it, but basically he was your prefect if it, at hostel. So you had to uh, make his bed, clean his shoes, uh, clean his room, get his breakfast, make smoothies, um, or whatever his things were. Mm. I was not like massaging feet or any of that stuff, but um, yeah. So I was I was quite lucky. Mine was uh, Foxy. Um, he plays. Uh, he used to play professional rugby. Played for EP. Mm. Um, and he was first team uh, rugby vice captain. He played 12. So he was coming in, was quite nice. He was like a role model. He was a big guy. Um, he was uh, approachable, but also he also had that kind of fear, respect relationship. Um, and obviously, you know, he, I remember he, still, he said to me, like, at the end of, it, at the end of grade eight, he left um, something for me as a tradition uh, at, at the one place in the school. I can't really speak about it, but you yeah. The, the matrix leaves something there for you and then he said i've left that there for you for when you play first team rugby and then obviously matric was there so there were there were a lot of guys that if you if you were lucky enough to make a connection with certain prefects helped and shaped i mean i still speak to him uh, uh once in a while today um so i guess I, I was kind of lucky to have him and then there were obviously other prefects that used to hit me but they were that, that was just because i was naughty so i take full responsibility for that <laughs> they, shaped, they shaped me in other ways <laughs> yeah, no, I, I fully understand what you went through I also went to an old boys school so I fully understand yeah Although what I, school did you, did you go to about if you don't mind me asking me I went to Springs boys so but we traveled oh Springs we used to play against Springs at rugby I played a bit of rugby but yeah <laughs> we used to play against Springs yeah we do we do sometimes uh, the last time I uh, we I used to go when we played against St. Benedict's and all of that. But obviously yeah. they wouldn't give us your guys' first team because they'd give us the F team and still. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I remember <laughs> that. But I thought we used to play against Springs. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I fully understand to some, some of the things that, although those schools are strict, but they still help you keep your discipline. And also, I can actually relate. I also had a problem with, <laughs> it's always been a problem child. So that's why my parents sent me there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure my mom was also happy to get rid of me for a bit as well. That I can fully relate. Uh, so now that you're in case, so now you move, uh, now you move on, but so you go to tax. Why do you go, uh, you, you start furthering your, your career. What makes you move because you've played SA school. So no one hits you up and says, you here's a contract. Um, so for me, obviously, in my year, we had the, the under-19 side and the World Cup. So we, in, the, in your matric year, we had all of that going on. So for me, it wasn't like, I think some of the years, it depends, like you finish and then your World Cup or whatever is after school, whereas ours was kind of in matric, at the end of matric. So we, I, I'd had that already. So obviously finishing school then and then Picking, on a, picking a university or tertiary education you wanted to go to mm. was pretty much dependent on our World Cup, not our Coke Week. So I did, I did a ride at Coke Week and whatever, and obviously that's why I made it. But mm. And I had a World Cup in Bangladesh, and obviously we didn't do too well, um, myself included. I had a horrible World Cup. So um, I think after that, uh, all the offers kind of went quiet, um, and the only other offers were not necessarily from cricket teams like Titans or uh, Lions or whatever. It was just than university um, offers. And obviously, not being an um, actual scientist, I, I had to use my sport to get into university. So I decided I might as well go to the one I thought was the best. Um, I had a, a phone call with Pierre de Brain at the time and then hmm. Kruger van Weg at Tux. Um, and then I kind of just decided to go with them purely because of the university setup. Hmm. I went there, there was going to be a place to stay. Um, I was going to stay in a house with Lungi. And um, so I was like, yo, that's cool. So I, yeah, I decided just to go with that purely because of there was no other, there was no like financial or cricket mm. contract from anyone. So I was like, I might as well go to the university, which I think is the best. That's actually amazing. And I've always said that um, with cricket and with, uh, what's this, with rugby, you guys utilize, okay, the system utilizes uh, the varsity cup, whereas with football, they don't utilize it, which really makes it difficult. I mean, if we can at least utilize uh, that uh, varsity cup uh, as proper so that those people, you can streamline or streamline players into an actual uh, team, then it would be better. And you can almost like an American setup, like, I'm sorry to say, but that would kind of help because people can get educated. And if you don't get a team, a at least you still got educated, but yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. But yeah, I usually say that. Uh, and then, uh, so, and then how, and then you play well, and then all of a sudden uh, the Titans are like, okay, so here's a contract. So what happens for the Titans to actually approach you and say, oh, here's a contract? Uh, so, yeah, like I said, I went to Tux. I worked with Kriya from Vek, which was a great experience. A couple of years for me, he helped a lot of my cricket. And as a as a person, I think I matured a lot there at Tux. And I'm forever grateful for my time there. And then I think uh, so I played a semi-pro season, which is obviously mm -hmm. under the Titans. And mm -hmm. that was without a contract or anything. Mark Charlton gave me a chance because um, I did all right in Varsity Cup, but all right at club cricket level. So... Gave me a chance for them. I think I batted like six. And I had a really strong team um, with Grant Thompson, John Avandia, and Sammy, Carver. Um, mm. So we had a really strong team. So I was lucky to play in a team like that starting out and got my confidence. I had a really, really good season in the four day, oh, three days and one days. Mm. And then, yeah, after, towards the back end of that season, I played, I made my debut in the 50 over stuff for the, uh, for the Titans, Obi came to training at the tu at Tux or something, mm. um, and then he called me out and and said to someone like, "Yeah, I, I must come to training with them." And then obviously, I just it kind of went from there. I played the rest of the season with them. Um, I think I did very averagely, um, but then I came back again to the semi pro, did well, and finished strong. And then they gave you they have those rookie contracts, um, which at the time I think they gave to myself and Moon Sammy. 
Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I was, it, it kind of just went like that. <laughs> uh, when I read an article, it was like, uh, you, your life has been kind of like a movie. Even now I can see that your life almost like a movie. <laughs> yeah. If you can make a documentary at the end of it, <laughs> most likely work out <laughs> or a movie at the end. Because uh, yeah. How it kind of goes like it's kind of te- teetering like hey dude you have to uh, <laughs> and then um you play for the Titans and in 50 over cricket you just blossom. Why what what makes you such a great batsman in 50 overs? <laughs> you just seem to have a knack of playing 50 over cricket. I mean, uh, for the Titans, your record was what you have you had an average for one season which was, I think it was your last season at the Titans, what, 43.28 and uh, yeah, 650s and 300s with a high score of 137. (laughs) Those are impressive numbers. Those are really impressive numbers. And at the top of the order as well. Yeah. I think for 50 overs, I think some guys, you just find your 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 groove um i think i'm still doing that i've obviously had flashes of it in the 2020s and flashes of it in the um four day stuff i think obviously like you're saying the 50 over stuff i think i've just been more consistent um and i think there's maybe more of a belief because i've done i've, I've won games more often in 50 overs so you just have that kind of belief that you can do that and then in red ball it's obviously a different a different kind of run uh, run getting technique or skill um mm-hmm. and i think that will hopefully be a bit better this season um but i can't give you the exact reason why as to my 50 over stats are better or why i've done better it's just <laughs> i think also you play in a i think if i look at it honestly the 50 over stuff we always had a lot of our pro tiers back at the titans um so obviously your level of like how you feel and how you play and what you yeah. have to do you just kind of raise it a bit um, you'd always be opening with either Aiden or Dean. Um, Dale would make an appearance. Mornay, um, mm-hmm. obviously, LB would be captain because it was white ball. So, I don't know, maybe also the guys you're around help you lift your game. Um, Lungi would be playing as well, so it would help you lift your game as well. So, basically, you're saying iron sharpens iron. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, so, maybe, just maybe. If you could, if if they could give you a run there, maybe just maybe you could do something in the fifty over game because, uh, especially when it comes to fifty overs, our betting order isn't um, quite as solid as 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 we needed to be in terms of getting runs. But albeit we we lack uh, all all rounders because everyone else seems to have I don't know a lot of all rounders and the betting just seems to get long and long. Yeah, I think. Our white ball side will come right. There's so many good players. The guys, especially mm. the guys that are coming through, like Yanoman is an unbelievable white ball player. Mm. We also a good red ball player, but I'm just saying white ball is unbelievable. And got Kyle Rickleton, as well. Kyle coming through. So uh, you got Razzle or Riza. So mm. it's a good it's a good side. They just have to click, and once they do, I reckon they can beat anyone. So I'm sure they'll come right. Like you said, there's always an all rounder thing, but I think it just depends on what type of cricket the coaches are trying to play. If they want to play very attacking cricket, obviously you need a lot of all-rounders. If you mm. want to set a base and go at the end, maybe you need more batters. So it mm. just depends. But I think there's a lot of good guys there at the moment. And hopefully this year they can surprise a few people in the in the World Cup because it's still a very, very strong side. Very good players. Yeah. If we had played the World Cup last year, we'd have won. <laughs> Everyone was on form. KG had gotten wickets. Lungi had just came back on wickets. Then he had uh, yeah. the combination of Nokia and KG doing so well. Yeah. Chris Morris was batting unbelievably. He had AP. He had Faf. He yeah. had uh, the cock. Quinton, yeah. <laughs> Everyone was almost at the height yeah, of. Like the when you said those names, it's not a it's not a weak side at all. So that's why I think guys, it's because I think also sometimes in South Africa we're victim of the fact that. Our seasons are a bit different to others and we might not play as much cricket against the big three as we mm. used to. So now everyone just kind of assumes if you lose a game against Sri Lanka or you lose a game against Pakistan that you're not very good. But if you're not getting to play because of the TV right deals and stuff, you're not getting to play against the big six all the time, 
we just we go on what we haven't seen for a couple of months but you you don't know like the guys are training hard they're ready to play if we had to play india now i'm sure our proteas would would win games so i think we sending a really strong side and hopefully they can make us proud as well mm. so let's uh, move let's move on uh, so you go to abu, abu dhabi t20 right we hit 106 of 57 balls and Brian Lara was there was like from what I've heard was like who's this guy betting and they're like it's the Zorzi. and then you guys eventually meet up so how does that happen how does meeting Brian Lara happen <laughs> no I couldn't to be honest uh, like the day before that game I had a very very bad net and um, I actually I think Bouch actually like kicked me out the net because I was having such a bad net and um and then Charlie, who was actually the Northerns coach, was on that tour. So he just took me to the side of the net, did like some drills with me, and was just like trying to help me feel good. And then obviously, I luckily got a nice game. Um, and then uh, I didn't know we, because we don't meet commentators and stuff like that. So mm. I didn't know Brian Lotter was there or Mahela Joe Warden was there. So I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. So obviously, you play the game, and then. Um, it kind of went because we played the last game in the evening. Mm. Um, so we, because we were so late, it finished at about 12, um, yeah, midnight kind of time. Mm. So you kind of just got into, after the game, you got into the, the bus, went back to the hotel. I was staying, I was sharing a room with Moon Sammy. So you obviously your phone mm. is blowing up, chat a bit, and then you go to sleep. Mm. And then only the next day did I know, my, like my uh, at the time my mom was sending me videos because I couldn't reply to everyone so my mom and my t- at the time my girlfriend was sending me videos of like mm. Brian Lord doing an interview in Mahela then I was like oh shucks these guys are here what the hell <laughs> and then and then I managed to I actually met Mahela first um, coming onto the field for our warm-ups because he was doing interviews and he mm. took me aside and was like no we'll have a coffee at the hotel after this that was a beautiful inning one of the best for and I was like I was just standing there like <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah then i only actually met brian laura like at the end of the um tournament um uh, because obviously it just didn't link up with commentary and all that stuff hmm. and then he we had like our end of tournament dinner function drinks whatever you want to call it and then he pulled me aside to talk to me i have a photo with him it's so cool I could, even when he was just talking to me i couldn't believe it i was like yo this is like everyone has their, their pre-match rituals. And when I was young, I used to watch mm. Brian Laura videos like before the game. So then mm. I was like, yo, here's this guy standing here. He's a lot shorter than I thought he was. Like, <laughs> and he has a like, cool West Indian accent. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm living in a dream. <laughs> but what did he say to you uh, in that conversation? I- I'm sure it must have been amazing. One of the greatest best men to ever grace the the game of cricket what did he say to you because he was so yeah. impressive yeah for him to say like he, he was just said to me like i was really impressed with your innings it's one of the best like young t20 innings i've seen and then he just highlighted he said just said like the way you played the sp- like played the spinners on mm-hmm. these conditions was like the highlight for me the the the, op- the shot options you played was like special and then he just said like just keep believing in yourself um he said something like Sometimes, uh, to get, what do you say? Like a knock like this, you, you you're probably gonna want to try to replicate it, and it's gonna be very tough to do that. So don't become disheartened. Like he said, like just keep believing in yourself. Like he said, this knock's probably not gonna happen again, like right away. So just keep believing mm-hmm. in yourself. Um, yeah, and then we like just spoke about normal normal kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he said, yeah, he was coming to come play golf, and because he obviously he knows Boucher, so he was. Talk, they were talking about golf, but I couldn't really relate to that because I'm not great at golf. <laughs> you but, don't like golf at all. But I, I, saw just, that I, just, foot- I saw that you're a football fan, though. No, yeah, massive, massive football fan. <laughs> <laughs> I saw yeah, Chelsea, I, uh, Chelsea fan, also, right? Yeah, massive Chelsea fan. Biggest. <laughs> uh, I saw that. Hey, this side, who do you support? Uh, I don't support anyone, but if I had to, I'd choose Sundowns. Ah, winners. I stay out of the Pirates and Chiefs. Debate. I'm just like, nah, I don't need that extra stuff in my life. I'm just, okay, I'll choose something else. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 
so w- with you getting so many words from um, AP De Villiers and uh, Brian Lara, because AP De Villiers, he, and when, when, when he was pressed, he was like, who does he see uh, being the next up? And he mentioned your name. And even Brian Lara said, I'm so impressed. So uh, how are you still able to remain so humble? Uh, well, cricket keeps you humble, bro. I mean, you don't always do well every game. So <laughs> it doesn't really, it doesn't allow you to um, like get ahead of yourself. And if you do, it brings you back down mm. quite quickly as I've experienced. So um, I think I played that. I got, well, an example would be I got that 100. Then the next game of 40 not out, we won the game. And then two, four day games later, when we got back to South Africa, I got dropped because I obviously wasn't getting runs. So... <laughs> Cricket, cricket keeps you, cricket keeps you humble. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes you like I'll have some of those videos or your those WhatsApp conversations with those kind of people. You have it like screenshot, and when you're feeling a bit down, you know, you read those things and just remember, like you know, you you can do it or you believe in yourself that you can do it. Um, I think my also probably the, um, my upbringing, how my mom was with me, she always encouraged me to believe in myself and like I can do anything if I believe in it. Um, but she also didn't allow me to ever get ahead of myself. And she even, she even now will still send a message like, Hey, hey what's going on here? So she keeps me, <laughs> she keeps me grounded as well. Mm, that's nice. Uh, mothers will forever be there. You always a son. <laughs> no, can never get too old. Uh, and then, um, you getting a double century at Newlands. How does that feel when you get a double century? Um, yeah, obviously it feels unbelievable. Um, first, that was second innings. So like you said, cricket keeps you humble. First innings, I think I was like second ball duck, or third ball duck. Nan Nandre got nicked me off, I think, actually. Mm. Um, I was so angry because it was a really good ball, but I probably could have left it. And I was just like, what's going on? How am I not leaving that wall? So then obviously second innings uh, managed to be in a bit of a sticky situation and myself and BRD managed to bat for a while. Um, and it's always, I don't know, I feel like the runs always feel a bit more better if it's a, you're under pressure or the team was under pressure and you helped win or you helped them get in a good position and you win the game or draw the game because of it, it always feels more impactful. So looking back, I was happy with that knock. Um, and yeah, I hope I can replicate it soon. <laughs> runs are always there for you. And uh, one thing that um, um, that I'd like to ask you uh, is, um, and uh, before you scored this, uh, the 200 people, okay, you, you have certain people saying that oh, you're a quota player, but looking at your stats and looking at your record, like, no, and everyone that knows cricket says you're talented. So, like, how do you deal with such? I think in the South African climate, it is something you're always going to have to face. Um, and yeah, there will be times when you read that stuff and I'm not going to sit here and say it doesn't affect you because it does. Um, you, I think more often than not, um, the players of color always, I can't speak for other guys, but sometimes feel that you're always going to have to prove yourself a lot more. Um, and and there are always going to be those people waiting for you to fail so that they can say that. Um, mm-hmm. I don't, I think the, I'm going to say the unhealthy thing would be to, to get angry and uh, resentful of uh, white players and teams, because that's obviously not helpful. Um, it's not things you can really control. Um, and I think, I think there'll be a lot of guys that will struggle with it throughout their career. I'm sure it'll be something I will have to face and struggle um, with throughout my career. Um, mm. Unfortunately, that's the, 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 the climate and the situation that we're in. Um, but all you can really do is, like you said, score runs. You know if you've done well. You know if you put in the work. Um, there will be a lot of people that obviously sit from the outside and judge. And, and more often than not, it's people, like you said, that don't really know cricket. And I think a lot of people nowadays, because of social media and stuff, feel like they have direct access to people. And therefore, they can have uh, direct opinions on what that person is or isn't, um, which is, which is as, as, I suppose, sad, but that is what we, we <laughs> live in. But I think the only thing I would say that, and I'll try to speak as honestly, is that mm. in those 
tough periods, if you have a couple of tough games or whatever, and you start feeling that it's, it, it does it does hurt. But I mean, you just have to kind of get on with it. There's nothing you can really do. Um, I'm not going to use bleach or something. So. <laughs> 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 ah, uh, 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 but would you say that you guys get uh, do you guys have psychologists or whatever for, for you guys to help you guys deal with whatever's going on because uh, yeah they are yeah they are available to us they are available Saka has guys there's guys that um, specific teams use like at the Titans I know um, it was more in a team environment but they used to use Maurice at a 19 they used to use um, Tim good enough so there are guys around that are there to speak to um i think because of because of how it's like i said people have more direct access people understand other people in the team understand what guys are going through so guys will come around guys you can speak about it when you um to your fellow players or whatever you're not as isolated as i suppose you were back in the day when it was mm. happening so if you had to, i don't know if you have to think of someone like Makaya, when that's happening to you who, who can you really lean on whereas i suppose now we are a little bit lucky in the sense that there's more there's more inclusivity so there's more mm. guys that you can try to speak to and reach out to mm. and um so now uh oh how is it also playing in the i forgot i, I really wanted to ask you a question but i forgot that so how is it playing oh. in the <laughs> oh yeah Oh yeah, Makaya couldn't really because yeah he also had Monday, but Monday was in and out, so he sometimes he'd run and yeah. But um, if hey if you, I was gonna say uh, sometimes players don't feel like uh, using um, what's this team doc or team psychologist because hey you're gonna tell my boss hey you're gonna snitch <laughs> rather get my own. yeah <laughs> no, no no I I, I get that one hundred percent yeah yeah and oh. Uh, because you were having such a good uh, season, as you were having such a good uh, time at the Titans. What made you move from the Titans? Uh, well, I, I'd spoken to Ashwell, uh, who was obviously Cobra's coach at the time. Mm. Um, I really felt like I wanted to play for a coach that was kind of going to help me uh, lift my batting or take it to the level I wanted to get to mm. or believe it can get to. Um, obviously, I'd seen... The younger guys that he'd helped with Verena, Hamza, uh, mm-hmm. Yanaman as well. Obviously, Peter's a, a jet. So I'd seen mm-hmm. the guys come through uh, betting him. So I felt like I can really... First, I felt I could join the team um, or feel like I could join the team and help him win trophies. But I also felt like it was a coach that would, once he'd spoken to me, that was going to back me and help me um, get better as a primarily as a batsman and as a cricketer. Um, yeah, I had a good time in the Titans and like I've always said, I'm grateful for my, for my time there. Um, but I just felt like it was a nice opportunity that I couldn't give up and, um, I'm happy I made that decision. Yeah. And with Boucher gone from, uh, the Titans, you're like, he was the one, maybe you could say, okay, why are you leaving the Titans? But Boucher's still there now. Now he's no longer there. So he. I get it. And uh, the track record and those people are around your age. So um, also uh, around our age. Uh, so yeah. more relatable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was a, a relatable team. I know most of the guys. It's a nice team environment. Um, I think this year we will, with a good mix of experience, with a bit of Vern, a bit of Rory in the setup, uh, Pani as well. I think we'll uh, do really, really well this season as well. Yeah, so how's Hashim uh, in the dressing room? How did you feel? Because him and Brendan are the only players to play pre-franchise, during the franchise era, and post-franchise era. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I think Hash is not going to be with us. Uh, so I haven't been in the change room or anything mm. with him. Otherwise, best believe I would have taken a selfie. Um, <laughs> But uh, we've had Vern in the change room and stuff. And I mean, I think he's obviously been very helpful for the for the bowlers when he's around. Um, so, yeah, I think those guys will, will always add experience and, and nuance to the any team. And then I think Rory coming back um, in a coaching capacity has been really, really good for the team. Um, I think obviously the bowlers can um, speak for that. But I think he's mm-hmm. been really good for the team and he's helped a lot. Yeah, because uh, with you uh, mixed with hash, 
yeah, you you would have been out here in terms of fifty over <laughs> to cricket because he he was fastest to a thousand, two, three, four, and I think up to five thousand years the fastest to get to the in in, uh, in yeah. fifty over cricket. So yeah, with him <laughs> you mixed with you you gaining a bit of experience from him, you would have been out of here. And fifty yeah, over. Yeah, okay. Oh, but uh, 50 overs is really the bedrock of anything. If you can master 50 overs, then T20 you can and, and test you can because there are, there are times where you have to ramp up the pace and there are times where you have to consolidate. It's almost like anything. 100%. 100% that's spot on. <laughs> so uh, how's it? Uh, oh, so playing in the Mzanti Super League, how is it playing in the Mzanti Super League? Uh, because... Uh, what I usually say is that if if we had kept that or but the problem is our our season is awkward. So unlike India, where they have the IPL, where they bring the best of everyone, and in terms of money, they had the financial backing. And when they play IPL, there's virtually hardly any international cricket. So how was it playing in the um, Zanzi Super League for your growth as well as a player? Uh, for my growth, yeah, it was unbelievable. I had a really good team both years, cool and um, good uh, overseas pros and, and normal pro tiers. I mean, obviously, it's always cool to to um, play with AB. Owen Morgan played, I think, the last four games of my first one. Um, we had Skandar Raza, who was also a great pro. Um, so we had a really good, really good team. Um, and then you're always, you're always learning from those guys. I mean, Riley was there for a bit. Um, and he's a he's a really nice guy to play cricket with, um, and yeah, it's just it's just interesting to always you have a lot of different guys from different areas, different countries, seeing how they um, respond to situations or how they think about the game. Um, you can always you can always learn, and um, I think a lot of them were also very approachable. Obviously, you the young one of the youngers uh, younger guys in that side, so you can always ask questions. Why do you do this? Why do you think about that? Um, and obviously, there was a lot of fun that was had in that tournament. So, yeah, overall, it was a great experience. So, do you think that that would have helped us uh, or it helped you guys? But do you think had we had that carried forward, it would have helped a lot more uh, youngsters growing up uh, in terms of because look at what it's done to India. I mean, they can't stop producing good players at, the, at this moment in time. They really can't. Yeah. Uh, I think so, because I think that if I remember correctly, there was a rule on amount. You had to have, I think, one or two under 20s or under 21s. Mm. So, yeah, I think they were, I think uh, because of that kind of rule and retainment of guys, you had Sapamla come through as, and myself come through as the youngsters. But, I mean, Sapamla had a brilliant tournament and then ends up playing for South Africa. So, like you said, you've got a guy that now has played international level um, from young has come back out, but at least he knows what he needs to do to get there and what the intensity or what the games are like when he gets back. So, and I'm sure he will, because he works really hard. So I think obviously it's it's a good, um, like you said, it's a good way of getting guys through the system. It's a good way of, I mean, if you don't have those MSLs, maybe you don't get to see uh, Rossi, not just young guys, but you maybe don't get to see Rossi have two, and Riza have two really good comps and then mm. play South Africa as well as Yanoman. Um, mm. I mean, and that's uh, an international levels tournament that Yanoman as a youngster is at the top of the run scoring chart. So then you can see he has another guy that we can pull into our system or into the pro tiers because um, him and Quinton were phenomenal that year and the year after as well. So I think, yeah, it's, if you can have a strong MSL, it helps, like you're saying, to bring in younger guys, but it also gives maybe guys that have been overlooked um, in the system, a chance to put their names up. Yeah, Rasi is uh, almost like Surya Kumar Yadav uh, in terms of you've been around for such a long time and people are only now starting to realize how good you actually are. Yeah, exactly. And obviously in that tournament, he was brilliant. Him and Riza were phenomenal. So you, like you said, you give guys a chance to put their names up again and just say, hey, remember me? And then now he's like one of our senior batsmen. So it's, yeah, it does work and it's nice to see. So now what do you think uh, you have to do moving forward in order to improve uh, it to that level? Uh, going, for, going forward, I think I said it earlier, just about consistency. So that 
be scoring more runs consistently. Um, and then obviously when you're not feeling in form or when you're not in massive form, still being able to get runs um, and accumulate runs. I think um, being a being a leader on the on, on and off the field for the, our younger guys coming through, helping Pani and Zubi with captaincy will also help me grow as a as a as a player, leader, and captain um, mm -hmm. and person. And then, yeah, like I said, just being more consistent, putting in match match winning performances. And I think maybe one thing is when it's your days, you you really you really make it your day. That's one thing I've learned from a lot of our good guys. Hamza does it, Verena does it, and then if you had to go back to um, like the Titans, Markram, Dean, when it's when it's their day, they really, really cash in. They don't just get like a 60 or 70, they make it 140. Um, Hamza this 2020 got a 100 as well. Mm. So just, you know, that kind of mentality that, okay, I'm in now or whatever, I have to really cash in um, and really make it good for the team. Yeah. Uh, how does it feel now playing in, uh, there's no longer a franchise for you guys. Uh, I've been, I've, if I, if, I can catch a few games. I, I, I watch a few games and I watch it on catch up. I watch uh, the the highlights. So what's it like now playing provincial cricket? Because now all provinces basically have a team. Okay. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's the beginning. So we'll see how it goes. But I, I can understand the pros and cons of the system. I think there will be pros and cons of any system. But I think the uh, promotion relegation thing that they have in place is good because it gives guys something to play for and something, I don't know what you can say, like not to lose for or whatever. And it <laughs> creates that kind of um, spirit. And I think it also encourages guys in a lower division to push. Um, mm -hmm. And it also, I think it will, it will also make coaches, teams, selectors or ever also have to look at the second division for good guys to come through. So I think mm -hmm. it's, you can't just have the same, it won't just be the same Jesus. I want to say circle of players in the franchises that there'll be more of an integration of guys being able to move because they've promoted from the second division up guys at the top teams might think, Oh, this guy had a really good season. He brought them up. Maybe we can get him into our team. So, you know, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of good stuff that will happen. Um, and I think it, making it these kind of specific areas, hopefully will bring fans closer to the games and closer to the teams. Um, mm. I know at province there's a massive, um, I can, how can I say, a massive uh, affinity towards just the province uh, and not necessarily Cobras as, as, as all the regions, but as a province, you know, Western province kind of thing. And I think it's probably the same of Gauteng and um, Transvaal, whatever you used to call it, Pretoria. So I think that will create that kind of um, affinity towards teams again. And hopefully we can get some people back in the stadium and get um, have a nice summer of cricket. Yeah, how's it been playing without fans? Well, it's not like in South Africa we have 20, 30,000 fans at games. But I think um, I think more the 2020s and 50 overs you did. Um, I'm, I've played a few games at Newlands, obviously seasons before for the Titans where there's it's a Friday night game or Saturday night game. Um, and there's a bit of a crowd, which is always awesome. Um, at Supersport Park, if you play a couple of semifinals, Momentum Cups, even finals, mm -hmm. you know, it can be a full stadium. So, you you know, you, those are kind of things you dream about. Um, you want to score runs when that's happening. I mean, MSL, there were a lot of fans. I think Paul Rocks, they had the best ticket sales, if I remember correctly. And that was pretty much sold out every, every MSL game. So, if, you, if you're playing in that, it's just, you know, that's... Uh, you, it gives you those butterflies. Um, and I suppose that's what you're living your kind of dream, if I can say that. Mm. But wouldn't you say Paul Rocks, the reason why they sold so many cricket tickets is because they are a sporting town, but they hardly get to sports coming to them. Yeah, that's, I mean, I've never really thought about it like that, but that makes a lot of sense. They are a sporting town. They produce, or oh, that area in specifics, they produce a lot of cricketers, rugby players, so you are right. There are a lot of sporting uh, legends that come from there, but they don't get a lot of international or franchise level cricket. So hopefully this year, if you get some fans in, I'm sure they'll have full crowds again and hopefully Newlands can um, challenge them as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, who uh, who in like who do you look up to? Uh, this is like my final question. Who do you look no up to in terms of uh, uh, being a batsman or 
yeah, who did you look up to at that time or even now to say, you know what, this is what this is the guy that I'd like to be like? Um, I was always a sucker for the the legends. So I always, like I said, when I was younger, I used to uh, watch videos of Brian Laura, like before I'd go bat and stuff like him. I tried to bat like him, but I didn't have as much flair when I was younger. So I kind of put away that tap and thing. Um, but I always looked at him and his technique and the way he played uh, fearless cricket and stuff. So you always want to be like them. Um, I'd say probably off the field, I looked up to my mom because of how she, she mm. is and how she treated me and how she was so um her and then that's yeah i think you for me there was like a lot of different sporting guys that you looked at so i was always like okay brian i loved uh roger uh, federer ah. um because you know guys like that they make it look super easy i loved uh ronaldo i love also love boxing as well so i mean I, I read a lot of boxing books so i love like your eyes and stuff like that so there's always these like little bits of inspiration on how those guys are um, little things you use. I wouldn't say there was one where I was like, okay, I had the picture of this guy on my wall. And yeah, but no, I had a few, a few guys that I really liked, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. And yeah, and that's what I really try to do, uh, basically, is try to get like a collection or not really a collection, but try to get perspectives from different types of places, right? So I've done an American interview, I've done, um, I've, I've interviewed Heki, I've interviewed um, T, most likely, or oh, you know him. T. Yeah, 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 we played, we played together at National Academy, yeah. Yeah, interviewed soccer players, I've interviewed coaches. So yeah, but how did you get an agent? <laughs> how does that work in the cricketing world? Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't have an agent. I don't, I, I don't think I need one yet. So I don't have one. I know a lot of guys do. I, I also know a lot of guys that don't. So <laughs> it just depends on what you want or what you feel like you need or what you think that guy can help you with. So I don't know. So at this moment in time, you're like, nah, bro, I can negotiate for myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, because I. For me, I feel like sports is heading in that direction uh, because you had Kevin De Bruyne negotiating his own contract. So I really feel like uh, once you get to that elite level, you can literally just negotiate for yourself. But yeah, let me get back to what I was saying to wrap up everything. Uh, I really try to get uh, perspectives from really different people and different sports so that, because it is sports talk with Kifu and try to... Um, what's this to show people or uh for people that watch to uh, to get to know you guys to get to know the stories and to get to know that uh it's not only one thing uh that someone can be uh like oh if you're always watching football you can only become a soccer player no introducing people to a lot of sports and um showing people that there's a journey if someone just sees you come up all of a sudden, like, ah, where did this guy come from? There's a journey to that. And people need to start knowing our journeys. Uh, most Americans, they document everything. And with us, every, not, not yeah. a lot of things are documented. So literally, that's all I'm trying to do. I'm just that's trying to true. document uh, sporting history. No, throughout the world. no that's, a, that's a good initiative. Bro. I'm glad I could help you. I'm glad I could join on the on the chat yes. thanks and uh I, what i've learned from you is that um uh don't mind a lot of things and we're actually around about the same age you're 23 this year right 24 yeah 24 yeah you just a year older than me <laughs> hmm. about the same age yeah yeah pretty much <laughs> thank you for everything thank you for coming through to the show and uh what i've learned is don't take everything uh too seriously and take what you can and leave what you um take what you want and leave what, what you don't want basically <laughs> because you took from your mother what you wanted and with all these different uh sporting um giants you, you've taken what you wanted and most likely you've left what you didn't want yeah yeah exactly that's how life is. And thank you so much for coming through to Sports Talk with Kifuwe, Tony Dezozi. And yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, guys, I, I'll, I'll put his uh, 
Inst uh, Instagram and Twitter down in the description. And yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. And this has been Sports Talk with Kifu. And uh, thank you, Tony. Cheers, brother. Thanks, man. Cheers. Let me. Uh...